Uh, hello, uh, my name is Dan Harlan. Uh, you probably know who I am, but if you don't know who I am, uh, I've invented a lot of magic. I started out by inventing some rubber band tricks, uh, and then I came up with uh, my own way to do things. And I came up with Cartoon, which you've probably heard of. That's uh, from 27 to 28 years ago, uh, which is amazing because uh, I'm only 25. Um, and so I've done lots of things during my career that you're probably familiar with. Uh, I'm currently the host of Penguin Live, the lecture series on penguinmagic.com. And then I also recently just completed a five-year project where I did every trick in Tarbell. I performed them, I built them, I made new routines, I performed them for a live audience, and then I explained all of them. And currently, I'm here in Colombia, uh, and I'm uh, lecturing and performing at a little convention that's celebrating for the House of Magic in Bogota. So for me, magic is, it's, it's not just about coming up with a trick that is really deceptive, although I think it's important that we come up with new tricks and interesting ways to present old tricks. What I think is most important is that you make a connection with, an, with the audience, uh, not just to fool them, but also to make some kind of connection with their real life so that they understand that what you're trying to show them has something to do with their everyday life. So what I like to do is I like to take normal objects, anything that people just think is, you know, something not special, and then I turn it into something really special for them, and then they have an experience that makes them uh, wonder about the world again, and we can all enjoy it. We all can laugh about it. I don't like to think of myself as smarter than my audience. Uh, we're all just as intelligent, and all I'm doing is I'm reminding them that the world is filled with magical possibilities uh, and wonder and laughter and sharing those experiences with people. And so when it, when it comes to magic, I think it's important for a magician to be well-rounded in their education. So to have a foundation in magic itself, to know as much as you can possibly learn about sleight of hand uh, and, and, you know, and about how, uh, how things are built, you know, constructing them. But I also think it's important to look outside of magic, to educate yourself on things that you're interested in. Now, I'm interested in mathematics, I'm interested in science, I'm interested in art, I'm interested in music, I'm interested in theater, uh, and a few other things, many, many other things. So these are the kinds of things that I study in addition to magic, that then I put them into my performance. And I think it's important to do that because if you're only concentrating on magic, then you have a, you have a wall between you and your audience. But if you're in involving things uh, from their life, like I said, if you take a piece of art or popular culture or some fascinating thing from science or, or something like that, that you can share with them, then uh, it, makes, it makes it more possible for them to ask you questions that you can answer. If you just do a trick and you fool them, the only thing they can ask is, how did you do that? And all you can say is, I can't tell you. And that's not good. It's better for them to have really interesting questions uh, and conversations that you can carry on with them about absolutely anything that goes on in the world. So I, I try to study as much uh, as I can about regular life, you know. And of course, those things that are really uh, fascinating about uh, what's going on in the world nowadays, you know, and, and that, that makes me more, uh, more approachable. Uh, so the the way that I go about designing tricks is that uh, I come up with I come up with a concept that fascinates me. I try to put myself in the mindset of a regular person who knows nothing at all about magic. And if the concept of it fascinates me, then I work on on that idea. And usually it, it's very complicated. My first try at something is very complicated, very convoluted, very involved. And then the uh, then you have to just edit it. You edit it down until it makes sense and it's very direct uh, to someone. So. I, I can't tell you specifically how you should do it because I think it's up to the individual, but I think that you should figure out what is it that fascinates you. Uh, first of all, what fascinates you in magic and what fascinates you about life and how you can combine the two of those things together so that you can make a unique expression. Uh, I highly recommend that you try to stay true to yourself and you ask yourself the important question, the difficult important question, and that is, do I really love what I'm doing and why do I love it in particular? So if you're doing a, if a particular trick, you may just like the method. The method may be good, but 
the audience doesn't care about the method. So you have to ask that difficult question. And if the answer is that you love what you're doing because the expression of it will connect with other people, then I think that you'll be successful. Uh, well, I think the most important skill that a magician should have is the ability to communicate, just like I'm doing now. I'm talking to you, you're not even here, and yet we're actually having a conversation. Because hopefully, uh, what I'm saying to you, you understand that I'm telling you the truth, that I'm being honest with you, and that, uh, that I want you to learn the way that I wish that I was able to learn when, when I was in your position. So whoever you happen to be, I'm talking to you as though I was in your place and I wish somebody had given me all of this information. So when I'm, when I'm with a regular audience, it's the same thing. I'm communicating with them. Now obviously the show is structured and so that communication is pre-planned. Like I've got a script all written out, but it still has to be sincere. It still has to be honest. It still has to come from a place where I know it's really happening right now. More than anything else, if you can connect with another person on this kind of a level, you'll have major success, whether you're a magician or a musician or, you know, an artist, what, whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, well, okay, so I've been around for a very long time, so I've had some, uh, some fascinating influences uh, in magic, uh, and many of them are, uh, many of the influences that I've had are historical influences, but let me talk about ones that are relatively modern. The, the first major influence to me was Doug Henning. Now, if you don't remember Doug Henning, he was very popular when I was, uh, when I was in grade school, when I was a teenager. Uh, he was the biggest magician on television. And what set him apart from other magicians was that he was a hippie, you know, big, long, curly hair and a big mustache, and he wore rainbow clothes, and he was so happy to do everything, completely different from everybody that had come before him. But he was being true to who he was. And that changed my mind about how magic could be presented because it was completely uh, unique to him. Uh, and then after him, uh, Copperfield came along and Copperfield made a magician kind of dark and moody and attractive and seductive. Again, an entirely different take on it. And the, the contrast between those two was so strong that it made me start to think about, well, how do I fit into this? You know, I'm not, I'm not as goofy and, and, and uh, as Doug Henning. I'm not so, you know, full of, like, beautiful life and all of that as he was. I'm not quite as romantic as Copperfield. I'm somewhere in a mixture of those kinds of things. So I went, I started to study uh, previous magicians, and I'm a lot more like Don Allen. Don Allen was a fantastic magician from way back, who was very conversational, very, very comfortable, with people. Uh, he was very funny, but he was also very smooth. He was a gentleman, um, but he, you know, he, he did little tricks and he did some kind of stand-up tricks. And so I, I like Don Allen and I like Fred Capps. Fred Capps was like Don Allen, but on stage, you know, but very smooth, but he also would joke around with you. So he was a, a stand-up magician. Don Allen was a close-up magician. Uh, not, not entirely, but that was kind of the distinction. And then I found another magician that uh, I, I never saw a Form, but I started reading things about him, and it was Bruce Elliott. And Bruce Elliott had some amazing uh, writing on methods and things like that. So I sort of took all of those people, every one of them, and, and of course everybody else that I saw, because I watched all the magicians I could possibly see, and I mushed them all together, and then I put my personality with it, and uh, hopefully I do something that, that feels like me but is influenced by all of those wonderful magicians. Uh, so, uh, if, if I were to recommend to you uh, some books that you would that you would want to read, I, I kind of have unusual tastes when it when it comes to uh, reading books. Now, obviously, if you're interested in card magic, you already know what books to read. You need to, uh, to read Royal Road. You need to read Expert at the Card Table. But th those are those are not the ones that I'm going to recommend. What I'm going to recommend to you are books that are general for absolutely any magician. So uh, one of them is uh, is Bill Tarr's book on sleight of hand. So Bill Tarr's sleight of uh, uh, lessons in sleight of hand is what it's called. And it's fascinating. It's illustrated in a way that feels like the illustrations are moving. But when you turn each page, there's a single sight on each page, and, and you can take your time figuring it out. It's like watching video, 
but in a book form. It was way ahead of its time. It's still absolutely fantastic. So he had lessons in sleight of hand uh, one and two. I like one. It was it was absolutely fantastic. But two is also good. Um, and then the other one is Bill Severn. Severn, uh, his uh, books Magic Shows You Can Give. Now it's basically a beginner thing that's geared toward kids, but it'll still be good for you no matter what skill level you are if you haven't read it, uh, because it teaches you how to make magic tricks out of just ordinary things around the house, cardboard boxes and tubes and, and paper, uh, and so you start to understand how to to uh, design your own magic. And then, of course, um, you have to read the uh, Daryl Fitzke trilogy. Uh, and the Daryl Fitzke trilogy talks all about the th uh, theater and philosophy and theory, uh, and then how you take the principles of magic and you cut them up into pieces and then rearrange them. And uh, mm -hmm. with those in mind, you now understand some basics of sleight of hand that you can apply to everything. Then you learn a little bit about how to make your own tricks, and you learn how to use your mind to create those tricks and come up with the best method to put it all together. Okay, a non-magic book that's good for magicians. Uh, this is a relatively recent book. It is called The, the Seven Laws of Magical Thinking. So the seven laws of magical thinking, I don't know the author offhand, but just, just look for that. And, and what it's about is the way that normal people, uh, they, they give uh, a, a magical attributes to normal things, like they, they say coincidences, you know, uh, when uh, you're thinking about somebody and they call you on your cell phone right? It's a coincidence, but they think that's magic, right? Uh, or uh, when people buy a particular object because a celebrity owned that object, well, that object is no different than any other object except that a celebrity touched it, and yet that makes it feel more magical. Or when people believe in ghosts, and the reason they believe in ghosts, uh, you know, all these things are in there. There are seven different categories, and he breaks them down so that you understand the psychology behind them, and why they're not true, and then why it's important that you still believe them. And so you can use those uh, attributes and, and infuse your magic with things that remind people that life is magical, even though it may not be true, it's magical in a way that you can you can uh, enjoy thinking about it for that moment. So if you use an object in, in your show, make that object something special that maybe somebody else owned or somebody touched or it came from a special place, you know, something like that. And you'll find uh, lots of ways to apply those ideas to what you're doing. Okay. Well, I've, I've been hosting Penguin Live uh, for five and a half years. Uh, I think it's been about five and a half years that I've been hosting. Uh, they did a few of them before I was hosting, I think for about a year or so. And since they've gone every single week, every week a new one, uh, so five years is about 250. I've hosted about 300 of them. So there's more than 300, and I've, I've hosted most of them. Well, uh, you know, over the years of hosting those lectures, there, there are diverse ways of thinking about magic. Not everybody thinks the same way, but there are many people that, that concentrate on the theatrical aspects like I do. I think it all begins with theater. Some magicians uh, are purely technical. They just want to do things that are technically amazing, and that's okay, because again, if you're really, really, really good at that, you can still connect with people. People understand how much skill it takes to, to do some of those things. Um, I, I think probably what joins all of the magicians together that I've met that are really good at what we do is that they absolutely love to do what they do. I don't think you can be in this business for many years unless you, unless you absolutely love it. If you don't, just, just have fun with it as a hobby. But if you want to do it for a living, oh, you better love it. <laughs> it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, let me recommend a, a creative exercise for you. This is something uh, that you can try. Um, if, if you're working on a magic trick and you, you get stuck, you don't know how you're going to present it. And I think it's important that you figure out what the presentation is. Presentation is not just... Uh, saying here I have this and now it does that. No, no, no. That's that's the basics. There's there's nothing there. there. That's nothing. A presentation should be interesting enough that you don't have to do the trick. That you can still just talk about it. So if you get stuck for a presentation, uh, go to a bookshelf that does not have magic books on it. Any other books. It can even be a dictionary. It can be any book that's not a magic book. Randomly open it at a page. Put your finger on it. Read that sentence. Close the book. Whatever that sentence said, try to make the presentation about that. 
Just try, just try. And, and, and maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. Most of the time, it's kind of fun. And if it doesn't quite work, after, don't give up right away. Keep trying. But if it doesn't work after, say, 15 minutes to a half an hour, go to another book and try the same thing. Um, it, it starts to stretch your mind. Your mind becomes more flexible because you aren't thinking of those presentations. They're presented to you and you're forced to figure out how to do them. Uh, and that exercise helps you to expand you know, the, the possibilities that you can use in your magic shed. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed what I've had to say to you. Adios.